como ustedes habrán notado, hemos hecho una, una división. Aquí hay dos Enriques, hay dos Alejandros. En, en los Enriques están en los extremos. Eh, dos extremos, no sabemos si es por ideología, si es derecha o izquierda, o si es buen, el, Enrique el bueno o Enrique el malo. Entonces, ustedes decidirán, pero yo quisiera pedirte, Enrique, que nos, ha, se, nos des un, bueno. una introducción a esta temática para que luego tengamos un, un panel interactivo. Gracias, muchas gracias. Hola. Bueno, buenos días. Eh, muchas gracias, Enrique, por invitarme y felicitaciones por los 20 años. Yo estuve en bastante estas 20 reuniones, no en todas, pero bastante. Y la verdad que ha ido creciendo en cuanto al interés y en cuanto a la profundidad de los temas, se ha convertido realmente en el en el acontecimiento del año sobre América Latina en esta importante ciudad. Me dio 12 minutos, que es lo que es una tortura, pero voy a tratar de, no sé, de repente me excedo un par de minutos, pero bueno. Yo me, me voy a referir a dos cosas. Este, primero, algunas reflexiones que anteceden las importantes presentaciones que tenemos ahí, porque tenemos, tenemos la CEPAR, el Banco Mundial, tenemos el Fondo Monetario, tenemos la sabiduría acumulada de Alejandro Fogley, que es muy poco lo que podría agregar a lo que se va a decir después, pero en todo caso, dos reflexiones. ¿Cómo veo el mundo? ¿Dónde va el mundo? ¿Dónde va la región? Con respecto al, al mundo, yo señalaría tres cosas de las múltiples que se pueden decir. Primero, diría que es una, el mundo está con una economía confusa, con una sociedad enojada y con una política internacional desorientada. Confusa la economía... Ciertamente eh, hemos tenido dos generaciones del mundo aprendiendo a crecer con distintos modelos, incluso distribuyendo, con políticas sociales importantes. La verdad, cuando uno compara estos 60 años con todos los años, ha sido 60 años de, de gran avance con, en, tanto en lo económico como en lo social. Pero hemos tenido elementos que están perturbando ese balance de 60 años de forma importante, comenzando por la tecnología. La tecnología siempre perturbadora, pero en este caso lo que más perturba es la velocidad de la tecnología. Y junto con la tecnología, los nuevos elementos que la componen, como la digitalización, la globalización, todo esto que está cambiando, la manera de pensar, la manera de producir, la manera de relacionar. Y la globalización a todo nivel y en todos los sectores. Ahora, creo que el mundo en esta etapa, el capitalismo liberal triunfó con respecto al socialismo. Y creo que de alguna manera... Eh, 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 eso muestra la, la, la avance que ha tenido la economía mundial y ciertamente también el progreso social. Pero están apareciendo elementos importantes para destacar. Primero, este, este, este capitalismo liberal que trata de vincular el Estado, el mercado y la sociedad no pudo evitar la crisis financiera como la de 2008 y todavía hay elementos muy importantes y amenazantes que, es que puede también implicar nuevas crisis Segundo, la reducción de la pobreza se ha hecho, pero justamente con eso hemos tenido una base espectacular de la desigualdad. Ha sido el gran tema de los últimos tiempos. Y creo que ese tema está arriba de la mesa. Además, el sistema quedó muy presionero del consumo. Plus, we are in the grips of consumerism. That is something where we may be affected by increasing growth. And I think that the matter of climate and the way that this accelerated growth can affect the environment is an issue that concerns us all. Now, what is happening? Yesterday, Financial Times recordaba Financial dos cosas Times que dijo el was ministro de Austria. Reporting on dijo what is que ahí tenemos que civilizar el capitalismo. Y la señora Lagarde, Lagarde, Alejandro's boss, said growth has to be or had to be too low for too long and for too few. That sums it up. Now we have ahead of us a low growth rate 
policies that are a surprise. The only active policy is the policy of central banks. They are the sole player that is operating everywhere. Also, we have injections of liquidity. Fifty years ago, we didn't think that this type of thing could happen, so we're quite impressed. And we're seeing that along with the increased liquidity, there are protectionist uh, efforts, but the mega treaties do not coincide with the objectives that always moved us towards open trade. So all of this has produced an erosion of trust. And words like deflation, like structural stagnation from Larry Summers are things not part of the most recent decades. And consequently, I say that the economy is confusing or confused. Now, our societies are irate. The middle class has grown worldwide, but there is malaise. First of all, because of expectations that haven't been delivered on. Also, because there were increases in some sectors, but only the elite. We have seen that many sectors are stagnant vis-a-vis -vis the plut plutocracy plutocracy throughout the world. Now, this is something that we're seeing in this country where the leaders, the leaderships of Europe are in confrontation almost everywhere. And this irate society is having a very important influence on the way international politics is going. Now, regarding international policies, I would say that they are off track. They are disoriented. So the political dialogue that was organized after 1945 is taking on water. The Pax Americana has come to an end that at that time showed the United States protecting democracy and human rights, I think that that is fading into the past. And international relations are taking on a different tenor, beginning with the United Nations, the Security Council, where these major issues are aired. And another important thing is that the authority, the Bretton Woods organizations that organize this system, is also being eroded because of the progress of this disorderly, disoriented world. And for all of these reasons, we face a transfer of power going from the west to the east. This shift in power means not only a new economic map, but also a new political map and also eventually a new military map. And in that connection, in that shift in power, there are elements that we have always had present, but with a virulence that we have never had before. The virulence of religious fundamentalism, different ethnic uh, and migratory phenomena. And this disoriented policy means that we are in an order that is hard to manage and it is one of a long process with a slowdown of the economy and an international policy that cannot find the appropriate track to manage events. I would summarize by saying something that I read yesterday in the Financial Times talking about the G20. And it says they were thinking of the insecurity caused by globalization, especially in terms of trade and migration, saying that they were feeding populist sentiment. And with that, a flight towards protectionism and xenophobia. So definitely not a universal solution. And here I'm translating it poorly, but uh, saying that no solutions were emerging from the debate. Now, regarding the region, I have three things I would like to highlight. The return of the cycle, middle income sectors are experiencing angst, and also the return of the cycle, we the Chinese phenomenon we thought had changed things, that we had reached the promised land, but that is not the case. 
So the cycle is back. China made its adjustment and continues to do so. And because of that, the major forces coming from international markets via prices have been decreased dramatically. Now that growth, 5 to 6 percent during the glorious uh, past years, has changed. And now in the region, there will be mediocre growth in the region with different situations in some specific countries. But basically, that seems to be a fact. And where we're going to have to have adjustments, intelligent adjustments, because I am not acquainted with any adjustment, no matter how intelligent, that isn't going to be painful. And we're beginning to see that it's affecting some sectors. Then challenges, ECLAC has said this many times, productive diversification, which means human resources, innovation, productivity, and at the same time, something that's very important, something that is challenging us, and that is the great diversification of international trade. 60% is intermediate goods, and the region has to prepare itself to diversify its economy and to engage in this trade in intermediate goods. Instruments are well known. I'm certain that they will be discussed by our panelists today, education, technology. But especially, I would say, a new state a new intelligent state based on meritocracy. Also, corruption is eroding us, and never have we had such low rates in the rating of the leaders of the region. And that's serious, because that is going to affect the ability of democracy to operate. So along with education, technology, a new state, and in that new state, we need it to be transparent. And I would say that a key issue is being able to reach a fiscal pact. That is basically the major issue that lies ahead. That is something that has been mentioned several times. A fiscal pact that would make it possible to find a balance between the economic and the social in this confusing world. Another major tool is integration. If there's a time that we need to think of integration, it's this one. I always remember 1969 when we were there when ALALC was created, but we haven't done all that well. Central America has been an exception, but generally speaking, the major integration objective did not receive the support or a major boost from the larger countries that can further the process. So if we ever felt that integration was the answer, I think so even more. In this world where there are these mega treaties, what are we doing as an isolated hemisphere? We need to find a way to act together. And then another issue is the issue of medium income sectors, more sectors than the middle class. They're afraid of losing the ground gain. That's something that can happen because of the adjustment process and states have less capacity to support them. There are administrative cuts that have to be made and that too is affecting the electoral processes and the political problems that we're all acquainted with as we look across Latin America. Then lastly I would say a challenge to democracy. Some things have been operating well. Electoral democracy is working as was said yesterday but we do have to acknowledge that some institutions have been strengthened. I'm thinking about justice for example. That's something very important in Latin America, how justice has been strengthened. But there are nonetheless major challenges. One challenge is strengthening institutions, the political institutions where intelligent adjustments need to be made. And also, there has to be productive diversification, a dialogue, and inclusion of the private sector. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Enrique. Thank you very much, Enrique. As usual, you have given us a full overview uh, and um, everything that is important has been said and what is not uh, important uh, um, has not. And so we have uh, a problem in our hands as uh, panelists. I am sure we will go deeper into these um, significant issues you presented. I, we have Alicia Barcina, uh, Executive Secretary of ECLAC, and we have uh, the Chief Economist of World Bank, 
uh, another Alejandro, who's the director for Latin America of the IMF, and of course my great friend, former colleague, uh, we both were ministers uh, 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 in my country, Bolivia, and, and uh, Alejandro Foxley, and Enrique, who is also a member of the panel. And of course, we will be tapping um, him for more uh, contributions. This is a significant point of transition for the world, and the implications for Latin America are clear in terms of the challenges that we have to confront into the future. Uh, during this panel, maybe we should focus on orderly, discuss a series of topics that are important. First of all, macroeconomics or the macro economy. Has Latin America achieved something big after the deep crisis that we lived through during the 1980s, the lost decade, the dead burden back in the 80s? The region learned, and this is significant, it learned not to focus on macroeconomics. And it is good to see how the countries have managed their economies. And even going through the 2008 crisis, Latin America was able to pull through. And now we have another challenge. And I'll leave you with this question. question. With the changing winds, as mentioned by Enrique, with the drop in the economic growth, uh, from that perspective, which is more um, negative in capital markets. One of the challenges that Latin America is for Latin America to go back to the past and look for solutions back there. So how should we take back economic growth? We, all of us here present, we um, forecast mediocre growth, 3 4%, and this is completely unsatisfactory. If the region has the idea of approaching uh, the levels of industrialized countries and have a great achievement, which will be the reduction of poverty and the, uh, uh, the turning uh, of large masses of the population into middle-class people. Enrique touched on this other point, which is critical, and it is regional integration. I personally think that integration is not a luxury, but a need, a necessity, because Latin America, fragmented as it is, has no prospect of accomplishing these goals, which are of high sustained growth, which be quality growth that is environmentally sustainable at the same time inserting itself within the realities of globalization. So I would like uh, we have been firm believers. Enrique was one of the fathers of integration. I think we were back there, back in the times of Bolivar and San Martin. We were already uh, talking about integration. Of course, we were a bit younger back then. But finally, there is a, an issue here which is critical, and maybe Alejandro Foxy and I talk about this all the time, and it is a political economy. What does this mean? Sometimes economists and finance ministers get together, and we talk about ma macroeconomics, and we forget of what Enrique just mentioned, and it is the importance of dem democratic institutionalization, and how can we construct uh, agendas in the long term which are needed to be able to achieve that goal of having a more just, more equitable, more integrated society. So this is the overview. I would ask you that in our first round of remarks, we try to make three minute, four minute, five maximum, um, five minute remarks. And uh, if you want to delve into a topic, then um, we can do it, but let's keep our times for each one of the remarks. I would start with Alejandro, the good guy. Uh, OK, Alejandro, the good one. Alejandro, the bad guy. Uh, well, who's who? From the standpoint 
uh, 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 from your point of view, gives, give us uh, an overview, a world overview, but it's in particular for Latin America, macroeconomic management and any other issues. Thank you very much, Enrique. Again, thanks for your invitation. And quickly, in order to keep to the three to five minutes, we see uh, a world economy which seems confused and to give some numbers clearly the growth numbers are revised these revisions are always lower the world economy is growing three percent at a rate of three percent in the united states below two percent for the first half of the year which was quite poor 12 14 months that they expected maybe two to three uh, movements by the fed this year by the fed chairman chairman but maybe we will see nothing and we see an economy growing less than what we would want it with uh, a strong labor market and consumer market, but uh, a corporate uh, sector which is investing less and an external sector that is being affected by the strength of the currency and due to the uncertainty worldwide. And clearly with a medium term vision where productivity is an important issue and where potential growth of the economy of the United States have been continually revised downward due to population issues less investment and uh, of course an issue where the uh, total uh, productivity of the factors is not growing. Europe as well has uh, been stagnated between 1.2 and 1.5 with constant risk of deflation and this financial sector still uh, has uh, problems. There is a focus of uh, uncertainty. And again, this year, we see a resurgence once again of uh, political risk issues and uh, economic policies uh, that are significant after Brexit. And uh, we see um, uh, populism, uh, uh, protectionism in the different elections in Europe. And we see uh, other risks in economies based in investment in exports and uh, we see that consumption and services need to, to happen in china For this um, affects Latin America. Commodities cannot be anymore the engine of our economies and Latin American economies can be grouped in four. That group which is having an economic cycle which is uh, determined by the commodity cycle. We are in the downward um, trend and then we would have Chile, Peru, Colombia, Mexico, Paraguay, Uruguay where of course there are domestic issues but the dominance is the external factor. Economies where the internal factor, the domestic factor, is the driving force of what's happening, like, for example, Brazil and Argentina. And the same for Venezuela, while it is the economy which is most exposed to uh, issues with um, uh, commodities, uh, the, their main issues are domestic. The uh, three and um, and all affected, of course, by the drop in the prices of uh, oil and oil product. Um, the fiscal debate lead us to think that all economic uh, economies in Latin America are weak, fiscally speaking. The world changed, not because they artificially expanded. Some did, but what we saw as reasonable back uh, four years ago, today is no longer that way. We have um, economies and uh, that depend on commodities whose prices uh, are uh, dropping and uh, we may see a um, uh, program of uh, um, reforms uh, in the long term but say Brazil and the transition in Argentina these two have to send signals institutionally to have a more solid fiscal framework and front loading um, of those adjustments, but they have to be committed to making the adjustments. And I, to end, I would say that when we criticize that Latin America didn't save and that they are going through a low phase of the cycle, I think all of this is true. But we have to acknowledge that in terms of levels, the achievements of Latin America in the last decade continue to be there. Chile is, is growing at 1.5, but the f five years of growing 5.5 .5, 
uh, and levels are there and living standards are there. They have not gone away and they have to be protected. Looking forward, they have to set the basis so that these economies go back to a faster growing cycle. But clearly, we need to acknowledge, as Enrique said, that the next few years we will see Latin America growing 2 to 3 percent. Uh, we have to avoid uh, policy mistakes uh, uh, that will perhaps lead us to growth rates of zero or one, and we have to work structurally so that eventually we see a more accelerated growth pattern. But these bases will uh, yield fruit in a bigger horizon than uh, beyond three, four years when we have dealt with education, corruption, uh, the rule of law. And so the work we're doing now is set, setting the basis for after five years have left and after that and for the next five years not make mistakes consolidate with what has been done and work toward the future thank you Alejandro Augusto what do you think uh, he, cl clearly Alejandro has painted a very realistic picture that we're going to be growing two to three percent per year and truly this is a topic that should be delved into in the next few years, what implications are there for growing at that rate? How can Brazil prevent the middle classes if it has negative growth or and then won't have greater growth? What implications will this have for the middle classes? But let's go to Augusto. Uh, uh, from the standpoint of the World Bank, uh, please uh, react uh, to what the, the good or bad Alejandro has said? Well, I would say that what has been said is worrisome, and rightfully so, because the situation is not all that favorable. And it is of concern in terms of the prospects for Latin America. I have a couple of points to make on Latin America, things that are relevant for this conversation. This is the fifth year of deceleration of Latin America, five years where the economies have begun to slow down, the second year of recession. And one necessarily worries about the painful adjustment process. But there is a bright side to the process. And typically, when commodity cycles came to an end in the past, as this cycle just ended, Latin America would go into a crisis. And so we would have to make violent adjustments in economies that were on fire, whereas now we had to realign consumer patterns, spending, aligning them with new global conditions. But this is being done slowly. And I think that that is good news. It's painful, but it's much better than having to do this in the middle of a fire. And in that sense, Latin America is a new Latin America. However, the maneuvering room, the ability to adapt the economies to deteriorated external conditions varies from country to country. As Alejandro was saying, in some cases, there's very little maneuvering room. So in the region, for example, we're seeing that policymakers want to say, I want to do this gradually. That's what they're saying in Argentina. Argentina has an adjustment that is still pending on the fiscal side, but it wants to use this space that it has because of a low level of indebtedness and also its return to international capital markets to try to smooth out that adjustment over a three-year period. Now there's a lot of debate about whether or not this is credible if the adjustment needs to be faster so as to be able to establish the macroeconomic conditions for growth. So it's a different type of debate than what we used to have in the past in Latin America. And I understand the position of the Argentines. They would like to see a bit of growth so that that growth will facilitate adjustment. In Brazil, the Brazilians would prefer there be no adjustment because of their political situation, but they have more wiggle room than many other countries in the region. And there, it's hard for us to predict uh, growth if there aren't adjustments, not only fiscal adjustment, but something that's even more difficult. How is Brazil going to be able to open up space to lower the interest rates to reasonable levels? For me, it's not all that clear. 
even if there is fiscal process, I don't think that automatically the interest rates will come down. So in Brazil, the complications are greater. So in this process of adapting to external conditions that are less favorable, we have two groups of countries. Some countries where the macroeconomic situation is a restriction on recovery, and those countries somehow have to more vigorously address the macroeconomic situation. Then there are other countries like Peru, maybe Colombia, where there is work to be done on the macroeconomic side. But it's not the macroeconomy that is the hindrance to growth. Those countries have other challenges. And here I would like to touch on a second point, and then I will conclude. For me, this is a cyclical problem. It's a cyclical. It's not a political problem. And we have to try to manage it. Even if you manage it well, managing it well means that there will be mediocre growth. So that cyclical return to mediocre growth is not what we would like to see. So Latin America has a harder, more complicated task ahead. And that is, where can it get greater growth in the longer term? And here I think that the main thing is in contrast to the last 15 years, it seems to me that it's going to be very hard for that growth to come from domestic markets or domestic demand. That's possible if you have terms of trade that are enriching your population that allow them to spend more so that the government can uh, develop its own consuming ability. And so that would take us back to stronger growth like we had in the past based on domestic consumption. But I don't think that those domestic markets are sufficient now to promote growth. So we have a challenge, and that is how can we find a way to get growth that is oriented towards international markets at a time when those markets aren't helping us and where global trends are actually against opening up. So Latin America has an especially difficult challenge. How can it find a niche in the international markets that will allow it to get the scale effects it needs to grow more than at a mediocre rate in a context where the world isn't helping it? And there, as Indica was saying, I think that there is room to rethink the matter of integration. Rethinking integration, in my mind, has to mean thinking of regional integration and seeing it as something that is complementary. It is a support. It's a way to better integrate within international markets. Used to, we thought that our integration had to be done at the expense of global integration. And I think that now we have a sweet spot where there can be improvements in the neighborhood allowing us to be more competitive and having a greater ability to join the rest of the world. Thank you. I think that this uh, is a good segue into issues that are structural for the medium and long term. What is clear is that the macroeconomy, the macro stability is a prerequisite. And this is what we preach all the time. And macroeconomics, there is no left and there's no right. What you do have is rationality. And countries, and they're very positive examples in the region of countries with very different ideologies that have been able to thrive because they have respected that principle. But the other issue, and Enrique raised this, and others have touched upon it too, there is a reality, and that is that it is mediocre growth that lies ahead. And that mediocre growth is not satisfying the ambitions of Latin American society. They want an improvement in their quality of life, greater equity. And what you were saying, Augusto, integration should be seen not as the integration of the past where economies were closed, but more as a tool for the projection of Latin America, for its insertion into the new realities of this world. But with all of that, Alicia, tell us what you have to say. In the past, we have agreed on many things. I don't know about the future, but let's go ahead with our panel. Well, I am 
left of you, and this is very important. I am to the right of the IMF. Everything is relative in life. Yes, it is. Uh, above all, thanks for the invitation. It is a pleasure to be here this morning and celebrate your 20th anniversary of this wonderful conference and with Michael here too. Uh, let me say, what I want to say is this. This is a different point in time. I agree with Augusto. This was a great uh, shock in terms of exchange for the region in effect and more South American than Central America. This shock in terms of exchange change uh, was um, positive for Central America. They are net importers, and therefore, this change in the cycle did not affect Central America as it did South America in big strokes. But uh, what my reflection, and you asked me to do this, is on this looking forward. And ECLAC has been working on a paper called uh, Horizon 2030 with equality at the center of development. Again, I didn't hear the word uh, inequality yesterday, and this continued to be a critical problem for our region. I want to say, Enrique, that what we need in our region is to do a better read of what is going on at international level. We depend greatly on what happens in the international con context. Yes, I agree that some countries do need to focus internally and do their domestic work before, but never losing sight of the outer uh, elements. Uh, the armament industry created a great uh, internal demand for electricity, power, rural goods, um, appliances, uh, refrigerators, washers, dryers, etc., processed foodstuffs, uh, synthetic um, materials, etc. And this generated and led, or, and also a, a social protection system, which uh, was together a full employment, um, an organization of the labor world, and there was a commitment to invest in infrastructure, highways, a, a big emphasis on cars, automobiles, and urban urbanization patterns. But what is the status today? That is my question. The United States had, back then was very important. In pre-World War, it was England. In post-World War II, it was the United States. But what happens now? In ECLAC, we see it as follows. The great um, engine uh, or, um, em emphasis now is the massive expansion of digitalization is uh, touching upon issues in technology, what is being called the fourth industrial revolution, which is nothing but the convergence of four things, which are very significant to me. Uh, the nanoscience, nanotechnology, and biotechnology, and knowledge, c c cognitive uh, things that are taking us to a completely new generation. We have information, technology, sciences, atoms, genes, bits, bytes, neurons. They are all in a process of technological convergence that I think is very important. Why? Because if we are able to give a big push, that's how we call it, the big push, the big thrust in the economies today has to start from something that was mentioned at the G20, and I don't know if they are going to do it. It is the coordinated expansion of external demand, where there will be more financial, fiscal, monetary incentives. But we have a problem, and it is this. We in in these four and these are tectonic plates moving one the uh, um, uh, thrust of china coming through in the world military technological as well in addition to economic so there are three great powers in the world uh, germany uh, mexico Ch uh, china uh, and the United States. Of course, the U.S. is ahead, especially as far as internet access. But so then, um, 
China breaks through the fourth industrial revolution that combines these four elements and Latin America is in the technology of consumption but not of production. We are great consumers of technology but we don't even produce a screw and so the global inequality concentration of income of wealth we always see inequality associated to poverty we should also associate it to wealth because a space that is clearly in the region and OECD is seeing it clearly is fiscal evasion, tax evasion. The level of tax evasion is 6.7 of the GDP. So there is no fiscal space because fiscal adjustments, all the economies are uh, working on this. But where do we have a little bit of room, of wiggle room? Well, uh, the corporate world returning a lot of the um, profits it has earned. And so let's remember this fiscal evasion in Latin America, 6.7%. And the other issue, which is climate change, the Paris Agreement. Uh, well, the most important thing in G20 is the agreement between China and the United States on climate. This is the greatest pull. If we talk about a big push, these two powers, if they agree and do transition toward a different uh, energy matrix, low in carbon, with a different form of production. We are talking about a big pull, which it will generate great demand in that direction. And we in Latin America will have to read this well, because what happens? I truly, uh, firmly believe, and Enrique mentioned, the dominant style of development is not sustainable. We need to have a change of paradigm that will take us to a great e economic push through the massive digital that is reaching everywhere through mobile telephony, but not in other forms of inter industrialization. And secondly, we need to uh, join uh, the uh, environmental wagon, so to speak. Uh, and let's talk now on po about poverty and inequality. We have reached a plateau. Since 2012, we became stagnant in 28 percent. Poverty reduction went from 42 to 28 percent, but we are holding in a holding pattern there. And between last year and this, we have increased one point in, in poverty and even more so in extreme poverty. So we are stagnant there in, in that figure. We're talking about 167 million people who are poor, 70 million people who are extremely poor. But all countries, all countries in the region have committed that by 2030, at least they will eliminate extreme poverty. But what does this mean economically speaking? What does it mean for our economies that it, poverty be eliminated. I think equality should be seen as growing to be equal, but to be equal to grow, to take all these people out of poverty implies a great engine of growth for the future uh, with the necessary consumption, uh, for uh, necessary consumption, not luxury consumption. So we have a great opportunity to do this, and I think we need to understand how we join this great technological paradigm that we are facing. Thank you very much, Alicia. And I think we are uh, walking in the path of great challenges. And what I see from your remarks and from the prior ones, the core, the crux of the future in a strategy of sustainable de development is for productive transformation, which has to do with more investment, better investment, increases in productivity, new technology. But now Alejandro Foxley, with whom we have experienced difficult moments, Back in 1989, we were both ministers, uh, and Enrique, the good one, was uh, um, the president of the IDB, and we had an important meeting in Cachawa in Chile. And we made a series of agreements. It was a point in time where we were leaving the lost decade, as it's called, and we arrived at a series of agreements 
mostly macroeconomically uh, or in macroeconomic terms. And then time went by and it became the Washington consensus. But it was the Kachawa consensus. That's where we met. That's where we agreed upon all those things. And Alejandro has a very clear mission in practical terms, not only in macroeconomics, and, but also in productivity. And I would like you to discuss the issue of um, e political economy and how can we build um, agendas for the long term. Thank you, Enrique. I would like to begin with the bias that I have always held. I tend to be optimistic. Today in Latin America, 70, 80 percent of the countries have already become middle income countries. And these are countries that, as Enrique Garcia was saying, I don't know if you're the good or the bad Enrique. I really don't know. It depends. It depends. As Enrique was saying, we learn to not tinker with the macro economy. And I think it's important to try to learn from past experience. I consider that we have been successful in moving from low income to middle income. And what we've learned is to tackle head on the challenges that come at us, challenges that are not short term. And as has been said here, what lies ahead for any macroeconomist is how can you accelerate the 2% uh, growth? How can we make it 4 or 5% growth? Now, yesterday we heard about Peru. Not only has Peru grown at 6, 7, 8% during the past decade, but its forecast is 4%. So, there are some good stories, but we have to find ways to accelerate growth. Now, that coincides with an explosion in the demand of the middle class, a middle class that we created. We technocrats have made it possible for there to be fast growth and reducing poverty and also satisfying at least initially the demand of this new middle class. But now we are speaking based on our experience, even the experience of my country recently. That explosion in demand is for better quality public services with greater coverage, hopefully universal coverage. And this is being demanded every day. Also, the pension system, pay as you go or any other system, has been insufficient. Public and private education is inadequate. People are very insecure in that regard. And regarding education, it's obvious that there is a demand for better quality. So here there are some dilemmas of the political economy. How can we simultaneously increase the growth rate and another key component is to allow that growth to take place. That has to spend more than one term of office. So how can we make that consistent with greater satisfaction for these middle class sectors? And obviously, we have to be prepared. That was done in the case of Chile, at least partially. One way out is to think of a proper fiscal reform. That would be raising taxes. But the politicians are saying, how can I explain that I'm going to raise taxes? And at the same time, I'm saying that I want the economy to grow more. And to a certain extent, what we have to think as a matter of political economy is using today's language, what is the new normal? What is the new normal for tax burden that is consistent with gradual recovery of a growth rate closer to potential growth? That's an issue that is not easy to solve. Politicians are going 
to call for quick satisfaction of social demands. Technocrats are going to call for a sudden adjustment, like in Argentina, where they just released gas and electricity rates, and then things get stuck. The thing is that growth, as we all know, depends on competitiveness and productivity of the economy, and that takes time. So there could be perhaps a common ground between these two needs. That's another dilemma. So you could say, let's take one social sector. Let's take education and focus our effort on anything that would allow the educational system to significantly contribute to greater productivity of the economy in the medium and long term. That would join together the social interests with the growth of the economic sector. But what is the dilemma? The dilemma is that as soon as you say, I want to have better quality education for all, greater learning capabilities, etc., the first thing that's going to happen is that the most organized sectors in the social world are going to say, I want this to be for me. So the college students that have very strong organizations, sometimes they're rather leftist too, the first thing they're going to say is, I want free higher education for all as of now. So the dilemma is a government that wants to have a good basis of support, good popularity, does it yield to these pressures? In other words, in other words, how do you explain to people when they say we want better quality of education for all, how do you explain to them that that has to begin in the first thousand days of life of any child? That pre preschool education determines the ability to learn of those people that will then move into basic education. And if they don't have that initial stimulus, they're not able to learn as well. And they can't learn to learn. So that is a dilemma. How can you reconcile that pressure on the streets so that everything has to be free for all, beginning at the top with those that have the privilege of already being in the university? How do you wed that to your need to support preschool or pre-preschool education? Now, if this is managed politically, we would be joining together the two challenges with one difference. That is improving the ability to learn, the quality of education, but that too is going to take time. And that leads me to my main point. And I say this based on experience because some of us are economists that have been part of political experiences in the past, and uh, we have seen from different angles this issue. How do you address these complications? Now, what I'm going to say may seem quite obvious, but this is from past experience. People understand better the difficulty of transitions a transition that is going to provide them with some security by having an increase in their income, income for both the country, the person, and the family, people are better able to understand that, these people that are now in the middle class. And consequently, they will sacrifice their immediate demands. Now, how do you get that to occur? By dialogue by dialogue and more dialogue, going out to the field, explaining with humility, with modesty, and planting an idea that currently is very unpopular worldwide. Almost all over the world, we're seeing greater polarization, greater confrontation, saying, I win, I win with one vote, and I'm going to impose my program, whereas what we need is exactly the opposite based on this dialogue with people. You have to figure out how you can rescue 
two or three strong ideas for strategy and development by reaching agreements, by having a basic consensus between people who think differently without prejudice, without leaning either left or right. In the experience in our country, that's something that we went through. We were in a very difficult political situation, a harsh dictatorship where no one believed in the future. And what we did, those of us in the opposition to that regime, we said, we want to open up. We want to listen to everyone, including those who had been in the previous regime. We wanted a dialogue. We took time for that and seek an agreement, not on everything, but on two or three basic ideas to drive our development strategy where social inclusion coincides with increase in productivity and greater competitiveness. And I would conclude by saying, and this is an optimistic conclusion, if 70 or 80 percent of the countries of Latin America have already reached the middle income country classification, what lies ahead is not easy. So we have already climbed a hill. We've climbed a mountain. And we thought that once we were on the summit, everything else would be nice and flat, a beautiful green veil, and that we would have solved all problems. But the truth is, when you get to the top of that mountain, you're a middle income country. But when you look over the horizon, you see a higher mountain ahead because the problems, the challenges that have to be solved to get from a middle income country to a more advanced economy, that requires greater sophistication in policy. You have to establish that dialogue to reach an agreement on two or three core principles that last more than one administration. And the major risk in Latin America is that people continue to think that if they win by one vote, everyone else has to follow their program. And that once I impose what I want, then I have the temptation of taking populist measures that will allow me to impose everything I want during this term and hopefully stay around for one more term at least. Because in these regimes, what they're after is power, 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 and more power. The alternative is on the table. There are countries that are moving ahead in the right direction. And that's why I think that the dilemmas that we face in the future are perfectly solvable with an open political class, with economists, with social scientists who understand the need to reconcile economy and policy. So I think that that means that we are moving closer and closer to our goal. I would say that in this first round, we have seen the interaction, the interrelationship that exists between different topics, uh, macro and microeconomics, growth, stability, social inclusion, environmental sustainability. And then the how impressionistic what I'm saying, but we have lagged behind in the way in which we can promote dialogue that will lead to understand processes and that people understand the difficulties and the challenges. I have the idea that the art of politics is the sector that has l lagged uh, behind the most. The private sector has done significant things. They have progressed. The public sector has also pockets of excellence, the central banks, uh, there are excellent uh, uh, revenue uh, administrations out there. But the art of politics, I believe, is what has been lagging behind vis-a-vis -vis the uh, challenges provided by the world today. Of course, we will um, prevail. But the trouble is that we live in the world and let me insist, I am an integrationist at heart. Since I come from a small country, uh, we have to be integrationist. But um, I live the moments of toward integration as an Uruguayan. But uh, 
but uh, this has not been the case for especially the larger countries. They have not been fully committed to integration. Of course, we have to read contemporary history and understand that uh, there are other people who protest, who go out in the streets, that the political parties have also lagged behind, I think. It's, it's, it's hard. It's challenging. Probably we'll spend a decade with low growth rates and where adjustment processes need to be reconciled with the processes toward change. We, we want to adjust and we want to change. We want to change because we want to um, have technified uh, technological economies. And we have gone through very difficult, dramatic moments in Latin America to achieve things that are taken for granted. And today, uh, we don't uh, spend time discussing these things that were so deep, uh, that kept us deep, deep in conversation back then. So the magic word we don't have in Spanish to talk, it is very clear in English. It's called compromise. And that's when we use, when we talk about negotiating and all these things. But yes, we need to have compromise that differing parties need to understand that they cannot win six nil. That's not how you win in, in soccer. Uh, compromise means that you are willing to yield to accept. But deep down, Alejandro, you have been listening to the concern regarding structural topics in the long term. And back when I was a minister, the IMF was more rigid, and I had to suffer through all these adjustments. But now they have incorporated a different discourse, which includes development and growth issues. So could you please um, share with us your views? First of all, regarding politics and governance, what's been said is very important. We have had 12 years as a result of the boom in commodities solving political problems with easy earnings. So increasing spending by 10 points of GDP makes policy easy because there aren't all that many trade-offs. So the political class got used to operating in a setting of abundance, whereas now there's scarcity. So now they have to look at the trade-offs. And the low-hanging fruit should be in the area of govern government efficiency. Enrique was saying that there are pockets of efficiency in the government, but neither in a family nor in a company nor in a government, if you can increase the budget by 25 percent, no one is focusing on efficiency. And in political life, much less. The horizon is short. There are too many objectives. There's no sole objective, and accountability is lax. So in that connection, quite probably the levels of inefficiency, if you look at efficiency studies done by the World Bank on spending, we have done them in the fund too. The results are quite poor and increased spending, I'm certain, has led to an area where the quality of government could be improved. Now, in terms of balancing the adjustment, in the long run, we have to look for an adjustment that is economically sustainable in addition to being socially and politically sustainable. And that has to mean it's complemented with other policies, and it has to adjust to the political constraints being faced in each place. We should not minimize, and someone here said that financial markets are hardening. Yes, spreads are, but the rates in advanced economies continues to fall. And here we find the governance mechanism to guarantee that beyond a medium-term fiscal adjustment in our traditional budget, you can implement an infrastructure agenda where we guarantee that projects are projects 
that are not coming out of the budget, but these are projects that have a long-term vision that are highly productive, etc., and that can be financed even within this fiscal adjustment process. And I would merely conclude by saying that with this optimistic view, we do believe that institution building can take place on the macro side in Latin America. And perhaps it's part of the process that affected the macro, but the micro path is more confusing. What are the institutions that we want to establish to be able to decrease uncertainty and generate a clear vision of the future? That is easier from the microeconomic angle to define exactly what institutions have to be created. Augusto. I don't know if any of you have touched on this, but it's the importance of the private sector in this whole context. You touched on infrastructure. If Latin America wants to accomplish what all of our institutions say needs to be done to increase investment from 3 to 6 percent of GDP, that's something that states alone cannot do. And here I would say that institutions like the CAF, the IFC, the private sector arm of the IDB, etc., have an important role to play. We can act as catalysts and encourage investment on the part of the private sector in infrastructure. But Augusto, please react to what you have heard. I think the remarks have been great, especially from Alejandro. Yes, the good one. Alejandro has provided us some basis for being optimistic, but at the same time, he speaks about the need to understand well the points where there's tension so that we can have a, a productive conversation with society as to ways in which those tensions can be solved in the world with, where politics has lagged behind in its ability to do the political teaching that is necessary. And there's a great deal of polarization or a tend to recreate the nation every time a new uh, government comes uh, uh, to power. Um, and there's a series of issues that uh, deal with the interaction between uh, employment uh, and um, distribution and other uh, issues. In the last 15 years, we had a unique situation. Employment grew, the labor market uh, dynamics was productive in the sense that the salaries of the poorer less skilled la uh, laborers increase more than in the uh, m more than the more skilled laborers and what happened is that the labor market explains why there was a drop in uh, the inequality in salaries in Latin America so this was a unique situation where there was growth thanks to the external lottery with employment and better distribution of income in a context of great social uh, progress. So to have that same coincidence of factors will be harder in the future. And um, if we succeed in general in, la in labor with international integration, uh, adoption of technology, etc., this will lead to tensions toward inequality in labor income. Uh, this type of growth is based on skills, which is hard to come by and produce, <clears throat> the success in growth may not be progressive, hence, and uh, it will introduce tensions toward inequalities, which will lead to a new debate as to where is the strength of the government to mitigate all these uh, tensions. And therefore, as Alejandro was saying, we need to establish the size of state that we want. In a world where I see that the new governments are saying, no, I want to lower uh, taxes so that we have more growth, without anticipating the fact that we will need to invest hugely in education and in social security systems uh, to transition to that world where we need to see growth hopefully again with equity. But the idea of having growth with equity will not be easy. And then we have another problem. If we want that growth, that growth requires structural 
a transformation which is deep in the region, which will lead us to being able to generate employment and scale with a vigor that we have never seen. Remember that in Latin America, the companies that have the greatest success and survive are one third the size of companies in other parts of the world. So in Latin America, we have a congenital problem that even when we succeed and when we have co corporations, businesses that grow, we still are in the small size, smaller size that do not generate, generate vigor. So the issue is fascinating. So if we succeed in growth, we will even lead to more tensions in social politics and in the need for continuing to look for social equity. We have very little time left, so I will request Alicia and uh, Alejandro, and maybe Enrique, you can have the last word, M uh, maybe. Quickly, I would like to say that in Latin America, there have been significant reforms in recent years, especially fiscal reforms. And I think that 15 countries of the region have done fiscal uh, reforms, and this is significant. And they did it progressively in, uh, on the income tax. Uh, regarding education, not any education. We need education that helps us to absorb technological progress, and this is where the core of our issue is. It's not the number of years. There are many things that needed to be um, um, tinkered with so that we are able to um, confront the challenges of better and more technology. I think um, women is an uh, Another issue, women issues, because if women were and disparity in salaries, if women had the same opportunities, earned the same, poverty would be lower one to ten points, depending on the country. Your country would go down ten points if women were to have ten points, I repeat, if they had the same um, education, the same salary. So participation of women is extremely important. Regarding the middle class, I have an issue with this. What is uh, uh, what are we talking about? A, a middle class that is indebted, or one that is autonomous, that is saving? I feel that I feel that the middle class in Latin America continues to be a very fragile middle class. I wouldn't even call it that. Is vulnerable to um, uh, challenges downward. Adjustments should be intelligent. They should be smart because uh, adjustments uh, have been affecting um, public expenditure. Finally, I would like to say something relating to the industrial policy. We lack this industrial policy that will organize and direct foreign investment. Let me give you an example. The one that has come to China, uh, direct foreign investment, has allowed China to appropriate 26% of that investment in research and development, and it comes from foreign investment coming to China. In Latin America, in the last five years, only 4% of direct foreign investment has been able to provide us with research and development. Research and development continue to be in the world of the public arena. We haven't been able to organize and regulate together with the private industry, which you mentioned. Finally, two points, two quick things. One is integration. Integration needs a new generation of policies. We at ECLAC are working in the value chains. We are working on the uh, input output matrix. Now we are going back to this again to see what are the links at productive integration level. What are the goods and services that come in and, and go out from each country and out of each country? And how are, can we productively integrate not only export on the export side, but we need to see what imported um, components exports from Latin America have, but 40% of exports from Mexico are imports themselves. It, Mexico is a country that exports imports. I think this is sensational personally, but let us analyze the value chains here. And now, intra regional. Uh, commerce is in trouble. We were at 19%. This year it will be 16%. The drop of intra regional commerce in Mercosur has dropped 21% only in intra regional commerce trade. And I think we have two things to do, two tasks for integration. One, a digital regional market, as Central America is doing with their electric grid 
integration. It's significant. They have um, overcome uh, um, regulation issues, etc. They are lowering the rates of electric power. It's an interesting challenge, very good, and it has to be associated to the digital market that is unified in Central America, and there are many things to do. And finally, let's talk about coalitions. What are the new coalitions, the new pacts, the new agreements with the society that need to be made? We need to change the conversation with the private sector first. And foremost, we have not been able to understand the political economy of investment. And they are not in private investors are not investing anywhere. They're going to the uh, stock markets. They don't have an appetite to invest. What we need to understand why is vision lacking? Is it financing? Uh, interest rates are very low. Yeah, so that's one of the issues. So what else is needed? And what we need is to have political clarity of the fiscal agreement. What are we talking about? The uh, um, governance of natural resources. Uh, someone s talked yesterday about the construction of a coalition with the society regarding management of natural resources. We cannot leave the communities uh, by themselves to solve it. We need a clear uh, uh, um, uh, idea from the government, from the state, to be able to say what is done where. And we need, um, for example, the debate for Chile, for the AFP. I think all of this is important. You try hard, but you won't get there. We need to have a pact, an agreement that is different. We need to change the conversation, in other words. <laughs> I wanted to pick up on what Alejandro was saying in his remarks by asking him a question. What do we need in the micro level? In other words, the decisions made by economic agents or by individuals. And putting this together with the idea of a major effort to improve the ability to learn and the quality of education. What we need at the microeconomic level is to create spaces for talent, the talent that is there and that is increasing in our societies. Now that means we have to think of the development process in a different way. A development process that is bottom up, coming up from the productive infrastructure, coming from the regions, from the local communities. And then that would join into public, private agents, also small, medium sized entrepreneurs in the region, uh, study centers, research centers. That is something that was developed very clearly by the European Union. They call this an intelligent development strategy. What you do is you establish a connection, a bridge between those who want to do things and want to do things better in the field with all of the forces that exist within society that can coordinate those efforts. And a bottom-up approach would also solve, and here I'm about to conclude, it would resolve the issue that I raised previously. Because what do you need to create a consensus? You have to bring together interests and try to develop a shared common interest. If you have a community and you say, we're going to support everything that you can do, everything new that you want to do, develop, diversify, send products to the rest of the world, that is a very powerful stimulus, and it establishes a shared common interest with people who have talent that they want to place at the service of new enterprises, and I think that that is key. I wanted to add to what Alicia and what Alejandro just said. It's true. Education is the driving force that can insert us into this new complex world. But if it's true that in 2030, by then, 30% of the known jobs will have disappeared, plus quality is going to depend on the contributions of science. So we have to form 
or train skills. Just as we train engineers, we need a lot of skills to be able to face the great diversity of the labor market that in the future would be quite different. That is something that the OECD is looking into with great interest. So I thought it was important to bring that up. Now, we're working against the clock. All of these issues are food for much further thought and discussion. So how can we adapt to what is lying ahead, what has been called the fourth uh, revolution. What does this mean in terms of education, skills? This is a commercial. Our economic report on development this year focuses precisely on those issues. This has been a very pleasant, very good panel. I want to thank the panelists, and I also thank the audience. Thank you.